Hello, everyone. Welcome to this morning reflection in the season of Lent. I think I've got everything settled. There's our candle reminding us of the light of Christ. Let's open this morning with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift that you've given us, that we can enjoy this new day by first focusing on you and our love for you and your love for us. And we praise you from the deepest part of our heart. We thank you for all you have done for us and all you have given to us. We thank you even for the burdens that we carry because we can carry them in fellowship with you and we can understand the purpose of those burdens. We praise you for this new day. We ask you to open our eyes and open our minds and help us learn from the scriptures this morning and prompt us, Lord, to do and not just hear the word. We ask this all in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. This is for the Friday after Ash Wednesday. And I'm so glad that you have joined me and Eeyore over here and Winnie the Pooh. And I'm so glad for this quiet space and time for us to think together. Today, the, the scripture is Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. We're going to focus on chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And once again, I will read this from the New Testament for everyone. Once more, Jesus went out beside the sea. All the crowd came to him and he taught them. As he went along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the toll booth. Follow me, he said, and he got up and followed him. That's how Jesus came to be sitting at home with lots of tax collectors and sinners. They, there, they were, there they were, plenty of them sitting with Jesus and his disciples. They had become his followers. When the legal experts from the Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, it's sick people who need the doctor, not healthy ones. I came to call the bad people, not the good ones. Boy, that's a, that's a line, isn't it? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, it's sick people who need the doctor, not healthy ones. I came to call the bad people, not the good ones. And now Dr. Wright's reflections. Three times yesterday, the doorbell rang unexpectedly. First, it was the engineer. He came to inspect the foundations of the outhouse. Then it was the builder. He came to measure for some windows that need replacing. Finally, it was the electrician. He came to fix some damaged light fittings, like the mythical number 17 bus you wait for ages, and then three come at the same time. They came, each of them to do a job. All went off happily with the job done. Perhaps the most interesting word in this fascinating passage is that word came 
in verse 17. I came, says Jesus, to call the bad people, not the good ones. Pause a moment before we even think about the bad and the good. What does Jesus mean, I came? He implies that like the builder and his colleagues, he had come with a specific purpose, but come from where? Isn't it an odd way of talking about a sense of vocation? Might we not expect someone engaged in a particular mission to speak of, I've been called to, rather than I've come? I think this saying hints at something we noticed right at the start of Mark's gospel, that Jesus was simultaneously called to act out the part of Israel's Messiah and to act out the role of Israel's God coming, yes, to rescue his people at last, to reveal his glory and establish his kingdom. I think this is what we see here reflected off the text in a sudden flicker of light. There are echoes here, after all, of what God says in the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 34. There, speaking of Israel as a flock of sheep, God declares that he himself is going to come and search for the lost and the strayed. Jesus uses that image too, of course, in various places, but here he chooses another one, that of the doctor. Imagine a doctor who was so keen to put on a good show that he filled up the hospital with healthy people. Not a lot of point in that, but the people who were keeping an eye out for Jesus and what he was doing, the legal experts from the party of the Pharisees, a kind of self-appointed group of moral watchdogs, make out that they're shocked at Jesus keeping company with all the wrong people. That, too, is significant. Why would anybody have worried about who Jesus was associating with? Well, people can be friends, we assume, with anybody they like. Yes, but only if they're private citizens. You or I can be friends with the strange characters we happen to meet. But if the prime minister or his wife befriends some dodgy or shady person, it reflects badly. It calls their judgment into question. And Jesus wasn't acting as just another person on the street. He was already recognized as someone claiming to speak for God, claiming to announce that God was now beginning or becoming king in the new way he'd always promised. So he naturally became a target. Imagine the journalists and photographers swarming around someone who suddenly announces the foundation of a new political party. Everyone wants to know what signals are being sent, what lifestyle this person will adopt, and so on. That's what it was like with Jesus. Jesus leaves them in no doubt. His new kingdom of God movement will be all about celebrating a new sort of healing. He's already been healing people's bodies, and now he uses that medical imagery to explain what's happening on a larger scale as well. Tax collectors were no more popular in the ancient world than they are today. In fact, they were often even less popular because they would be working for some regime or other, either the Romans, the hated pagans, who were the ultimate overlords, or one of the Herod family, local, but not much better. The reason there was a tax booth just along the seashore from Capernaum is that you would cross over from Herod Antipas's territory into that of his brother Philip, in a small community, everyone would know everyone else, and once some, someone was regarded as a bad character, that would be it. Nobody would want to be friends. 
except other people who had been treated in the same way. And Jesus was determined to treat them differently. This was not, just to be clear, because, so to speak, God likes bad characters and wants them to stay as bad characters. No, God loves bad characters and wants to rescue them. Sometimes people today speak as though Jesus simply tells people that they are all right the way they are, that that would be like a doctor filling the hospital with sick people and leaving them still sick. When Jesus says, follow me, it is, of course, a wonderful affirmation of who we are deep down inside. You are a human being made to reflect God's image and glory into the world. And Jesus is calling you to do that, just that, in whatever specific way God wants from you. That is part of the message of Lent, a new calling. But this doesn't mean we can continue to live in the ways we've always lived. On the contrary, when Jesus calls someone said Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he commands them to come and die. When Jesus calls someone, said Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he commands them to come and die. We shall see that soon enough. The death begins right here as the sick people discover that Jesus heals them so that they leave that old life behind. But as with the gospel as a whole, the death happens so that new life can grow in its place. When you hear Jesus calling, follow me, you should expect both from sickness to health, from death to life. Our prayer for today, help me gracious Lord, to hear you calling, to celebrate your love, and to accept your healing in every area of my life. Amen. Thank you, dear friends, for being with me this morning. I pray God's blessing on you as you hear your calling, as you celebrate your love, the Lord's gracious love, and to accept God's healing in every area of your life. Amen.